I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump I back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 195. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Argo, yes. we're going to be talking about Brian Cranston, kind of a beloved figure. Yes. Um, I feel like a long time coming. Long time coming, and still, I don't think he gets the uh, opportunities he deserves because yeah. of what he does, but, you know. It's kind of crazy mm. to realize that his film career that's actually been big and prolific is like the last four years, three years. And even the films <laughs> he's been in, he's really been in small side mm -hmm. roles, so yeah. we really kind of had to dig deep to get in some of this discussion. Speaking of which, digging deep, why don't you get this started by giving a little bit of trivia before we get into it. Yeah, it's interesting to note that before any of his television work, which obviously will be what we start with, in America, he did a lot of voice acting work for Japanese animation. Uh, he worked with Sabai Entertainment, who did Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. He, he did voice acting for, I believe, some uh, Studio Ghibli. Wow, one or, or at cool. least little or stuff. A lot of weird, random voice acting he did. So much that so though he worked for Sabai Entertainment that the Blue Ranger on the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is named after Brian Cranston. He's named Brian. He's actually named Billy Cranston, which is one of the things that he 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 was uh, current uh, listed at as at the time. Mm -hmm. He did so much work as various parts of the crew, voiceover, wow, uh, you know, dubbing and things like very all sorts of various parts because he was that, just a guy Brian. that they named the Blue Ranger after him. Awesome. Billy Cranston. Good enough. Old school. Yeah. OG. Uh, um, speaking of his work, though, mm -hmm. for me, uh, I first became aware of him with Malcolm in the Middle. Yes. This is obviously the series, which is based around Frankie Muniz's character, yes. who's, you know, a young kid growing up in a dysfunctional family. He's it's the middle child. Middle child. It's a comedic um, show. I guess mm -hmm. he, you know, ultimately becomes the second to yeah, last. He's technically the third child but yeah. the f oldest son is so non-present yeah. for the first few seasons that he's yeah he has middle child syndrome even if he's not a middle well, he's child present officially. he's just not with the rest of them yeah. but he's totally middle child syndrome yeah striving for sure. attention you know sure I'll, so. I'll agree with that and you know it's it's funny to think about because it was such a wacky show and that was my first exposure yes. to brian cranston and you know playing the father yes playing the father um how mm -hmm. and you know, the show was very, it was fairly well regarded. I mean, mm -hmm. got, it got a, a couple Golden Globe nominations and it got, let's see, um, I think like 30 Emmy nominations. Wow. But of that, um, only one Golden Globe, or no, sorry, eight Golden Globes. Okay. Um, but only one of which was Cranston getting nominated. Okay. And of all the 30 Emmy nominations, only three of them huh. were him. So, I mean, I guess that's it's almost once a year, almost. Okay. But even still, it's like only half of these seasons the show well, ran. Yeah, it went for six seasons? Mm -hmm. oh. Only half of those he got a nomination for, which is a shame. I mean, I guess that shows you how low regard people had for the show, perhaps, yeah. or, or for his wacky antics in the show that people just sort of wrote him off as sort of an over-the-top actor, perhaps. Yeah. Probably, because he did kind of come across as that. I mean, not n in no way stereotypical, but he was the like TV zany dad. Even though his function in the would, family was definitely different, he was very much a. Like, I would say he's even more of a ramped up classic TV dad because uh, you think yeah. of most dads yeah. like are wacky, but like he is like slapstick wacky. Yes, like it's it's over the top craziness yes. with them, and you know it's. I mean. Showed it a lot of interesting things, like it didn't have a laugh track, which was actually rather surprising that's for comedies at the yeah. time. I mean, uh, I think now that's almost more the norm in the shows that we think of as being interesting or new. It also did a split narrative between yeah. the older brother and the rest of the yeah. family, where it cut back and forth with, you know, like him calling and stuff like that, and sort of, um, I think it wasn't until like way late in the show did they actually really cross paths. Yeah, that. yeah, they brought him back eventually later and then shoved him away again because yeah. they realized the dynamic of the show wasn't made for her fourth brother. And, you know, in regards to the critical acclaim, it was pretty much all Frankie Muniz and Jane Kaczmarek who mm -hmm. got, I mean, between the two of them, they got a whole bunch of nominations. For Which is weird because the, made, the factoid that interested me the most about this show, other than the fact that they didn't use Laugh Track, is that Justin Burfield... Eric Persullivan, the two younger, the mm -hmm. Reese and the, uh, uh, Dewey, Dewey the two and opposites. Brian Cranston, the three of them are the only three to, that cast members that are in every episode. Yeah, there's one that 
the other three were not in. Well, yeah, Frankie Muniz was not oh, in sorry. one episode because it was a clip show, and then Jane Krasinski was, or Chris, Chris Masterson and Jane Kesmerich Kesmerich, were, were not in one as well. So yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty yeah. funny thing. So you think about the fact that a show about Frankie Muniz, that the only per that his two immediate brothers and his father were the only ones that How were technically in. How did they do a clip in... show without him? That seems really weird. It was the second one, Malcolm in the Middle, clip show number two. So, I don't and know. they had no Malcolm in no it. No Malcolm in it. That's pretty wild. I know. All right, you know, I I mean, I I personally And if you've watched a lot of that show, the episode where Brian Cranston roller skates was his favorite episode to film that was it funny. Took, he took like weeks to teach himself to roller skate just for that episode. I don't I don't I'm not surprised. Dedication. He's a pretty, yeah, he's a pretty dedicated dude. And you know, I won't say that I absolutely love the show, but it 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 was definitely funny and it was definitely quirky and it was very um, creative. So I I got. I don't usually that. think about Fox for their comedies outside of mm. animated shows. No, so it was kind sure. of surprising to at the time and, and, to have a good and it was so it was different and it was kind of in the same way where Roseanne went with sitcoms where it was a kind of darker more realistic undercurrent of the like happy go lucky family. I actually, it was going to go a different way. I was going to say it was more like almost like a, an Arrested Development mm. where it was sort of like really quirky and yeah. it's kind of amazing that this show lasted six seasons. It's I mean, true, especially it, on Fox. Yeah, it's, it seems... It Notorious seemed, Hatchetman. Totally. It's, it seems amazing, because this, this show is so quirky that it easily could have been canceled. And I mean, it was probably just as, if not more, bizarre than Arrested Development. Yeah, and it launched Frankie Muniz's career and to the <laughs> point where he did like one or two movies and then retired. Yeah, he's like a race car driver yeah, now. I think he retired at like 20-something, like from everything. Just Yeah. And people made fun of him. He's like, "Hey, I got fifteen million dollars in the bank." So, well, he also he also he also <laughs> was more interested in driving too. So that was just sort of like an excuse. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, even though he was successful in one hundred and fifty episodes, yes. one hundred and fifty-one episodes of the show, he really has had a lot of trouble gaining traction in yes. terms of parts. Granted, he's played a lot of interesting small parts in movies, but yes. he hasn't gotten a lot of huge roles. Correct, and. One of the first ones we're going to talk about is Little Miss Sunshine, where he played Stan Grossman, which a lot of people might not even remember, but Stan Grossman was one of the guys, or the guy involved with um, Greg Kinnear in terms of yes. like launching his... Was it self-help That's right. Promotion is, is he his agent? Agent, agent or, yeah. 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 Um, and sort of he leads Greg Kinnear on so that he believes that this is going to happen while gotcha. sort of like nothing really yeah. is going to happen. Yeah. And so it's kind of interesting that, you know, granted we'll get into more of his like extreme opposite of <laughs> Malcolm in the middle personas, but yes. he, he has done uh Dick and he's done it well. For instance, he also was uh Tim Watley in Seinfeld, yes. the dentist, which that's was right. obviously the basis of the anti dentite yes, whole storyline right. undercurrent in Seinfeld. So that was kind of a dickish role uh -huh. too. And so despite, you know, playing a happy go lucky and having that be a lot of his um notoriety. Notoriety, yeah. He actually has done he's done these good other sort of alternate roles of being like dicks and yeah, stuff or like severe, that. Yeah, severe like harsh characters. Yeah, and, and you know, I this is one of those examples and I I love Old Miss Sunshine. I think yeah. it's great. And it's kind of unfortunate. I mean, his part is pretty small. Um so small that it, it really it almost doesn't register for me, yeah. honestly. Like, I love the family. Yeah, I think I, I had to look up Google images of it to remember even who his part was yeah. when I researched it. I mean, it. I, I, I like, remember... Wait, he was in that? I remembered, I remembered who he was, but it was sort of like... The family is so good and so well cast yeah. that there's nobody. Yeah, there's nobody outside of that van that matters. Well, not only that, but there's nobody that he's better than. Like who? Uh, if, yeah. you, if you're gonna it's say true. he's better than anyone in the family, yeah, who would yeah. it be? Like yeah, exactly. I, I honestly, like maybe Tony Collette. Like, but there's nobody. Yeah. Even her, that's yeah. like just bullshitting. Yeah, honestly, that, like that's just, just that's just picking somebody that you think was the weakest character and trying to put him above it. That's yeah, all that is. It's, just, <laughs> it's just complete fabrication, and and I love it so much that you know I was so excited when uh, was it John. Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris finally came back this year to direct their second film, Ruby Sparks. Yes. Granted, I didn't really love also that one Paul quite Dano. as much. Yep, also Paul Dano. Granted, that one wasn't quite as um, engaging, mm. I'll say. It's sort of the opposite of this. Like, uh, Little Miss Sunshine's really dark and ends on an up note, mm. whereas Ruby Sparks is um, really fairly light and ends on a pretty dark <laughs> note. Um, but, you know, yeah, I love this movie. And, I, I mean... It, he might be just a dot in the sea of Little Miss Sunshine, but it's it's an important dot, and I enjoy that dot. Weird thing about Little Miss Sunshine, Abigail Breslin wore a fat suit. I totally believe that. 
I totally like if you look at her like in any other role. Well, I know, but see, that's the thing is she wasn't in any other role that was relevant before that. So as f when I saw that movie, but they had to do it for the character. Yeah, but I just assumed they picked a little chubby kid. Like, well, that's like, what that, that's because you know, she was nobody. And then totally. afterwards, she was so thin. I thought like, oh, Hollywood happened. Her mom told her well, that, to lose eighty. That's pounds exactly she, what I thought as well. Yeah. And so that is funny, but you know. I can totally see it. She's so cute as that kid. You no, know, I can like, see it, but it was just blew my mind because I would never think I would never it's think weird. without it being morbidly obese that Hollywood would ever use a fat suit for a child unless it was it's like weird, yeah. so severe. But but it's such a subtle like heaviness that they put on her that it's like kind of an interesting it it's is. almost like one of those choices where they're like, just get a happy go lucky kid and we'll put him in a fat suit. Who cares how they I look? would be willing to bet she also lost some weight though since then. Because I mean there's stuff like you oh, know, well, like obviously she's mouth, clearly lost arms some weight, yeah. Like like there's kid just, fat. Yeah, you know, just growing up and getting you know Also weird to realize that they almost didn't cast Steve Carell because he was so unknown at the time because he was That's in the, he was in the office, but it was it hadn't broke so super huge yet, and he had done his biggest thing at that time was the forty year old virgin, which was not like Steve Carell was not the thing that came out as like oh my god Steve Carell's a superstar. The forty year old virgin was popular. It but was it wasn't. very popular. That's weird to think that he was sort of like considered an unknown property. Yeah, because I think casting. I don't remember when I think both those both the office and um, when the office started to get huge and or start and uh 40 year old virgin was the year right before this they almost didn't cast him and then while okay. i think they were in production or like post-production yeah. his career blew up so much that they changed the entire marketing of it so to be to put him way far forward well i mean he's a he's a really important part of it oh and so he's I a got, great actor yeah, in that film it's so it's not like he doesn't deserve yeah. it it's just weird to realize you Funny. think we we it's just boggles my mind to think back that only what six years ago steve somebody considered steve carell a Virtual unknown. Yeah, that that's just pretty wild. that's just crazy to me. You know, Brian Cranston is probably going to be best known. I mean, assuming he doesn't go on to do something even more incredible, yes. which seems hard to believe, for his work on Breaking Bad, yes. which occurred. Let's see, Malcolm Hill ended two thousand six, yeah, and Breaking Bad two thousand eight, two thousand eight, yeah, yeah. Um, it's crazy to think that in the span of the two years you can go from <laughs> one part that's like the happiest go lucky yes. character to the darkest possibly the darkest part in all of television yeah probably like, the dark one of the darkest protagonists that television's ever seen I mean, as far as like following so and trying to justify I mean, the, the actions the only one i can think of that's sort of probably in that conversation off the time i had would be somebody like omar from the wire i was thinking sopranos Where, also I don't think any of those people. <laughs> yeah. No, I just mean in the sense of being like villainous, not as much in in a scope of how much they do, but in being a villainous main character. But that's my, like, that's my I also think there's sort of like an element of empathy to oh, yeah. um, to Brian Cranston in Breaking Bad. Because if you Walter don't know, Wright. Breaking Bad is uh, if you somehow live in a cave and don't know anything about it, it's about a chemistry high school chemistry teacher who finds out he has terminal cancer and decides to go into a life of crime, cook, cook meth, cooking meth to, to make, make a bunch money, of money yeah. to provide for his family after he's gone. And what the show has turned into, without spoiling anything for people who haven't seen it, is essentially an origin story of a supervillain, as far as I'm concerned. It's pretty much like a very realistic, start-to-finish, normal person becomes a villain. That's oh, the it's, Yeah, it's just sort of like, you know, watching the gradual corruption of yes. the person. And, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's my favorite show on television right now. Mm -hmm. I think, I think yeah. it's absolutely amazing. Like, it, it's sort of funny to think about the same guy from Malcolm in the Middle, but it's also like, <laughs> I, I never really thought about his acting in Malcolm in the Middle, whereas yes. in Breaking Bad, it's, it's impossible. It's, all about his it's impossible to look away. And, you know, he never really got credit, as much credit as he deserved to Malcolm the Mill. He got yes. nominated three times, never won any of them. Um, then you get to Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, he's been, there have been two Golden Globe nominations, both for him. Mm -hmm. He's lost both of them, if you wow. can believe that. He lost to Steve Buscemi in 2011, and he lost to Kelsey Grammer this year. Wow. So that's crazy to think about. Wow. And if you think about it, as amazing as a show as that is, mm -hmm. it's never won Best Dramatic series at the Emmys. And you it, know, it's lost to Mad Men, Mad all Men. four years. <laughs> nah, not all four years. It lost to Homeland this year, uh, yes. which also beat Mad Men. Yes. So, I mean, all those other shows are great. Yeah. But I don't think they're better than Breaking Bad. I think Breaking yeah. Bad is the best. Like, it yeah. is just... I haven't seen Homeland, so it's hard for me to say, and I love, and absolutely show. love Mad Men. Great show. But... Breaking Bad, like the acting, there's no single character in Breaking in uh, Mad Men 
that I can put above either him or Aaron Paul for that matter. Both of them are so captivating yeah, even, that uh, it's what's his name, Dean Norris? Or... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Dean Hank, Norris, who plays he, Hank Schroeder. Yeah, he's great too. I mean, it's obviously Giancarlo Esposito was amazing. And, yeah, uh, and yeah. Bob Odenkirk as Saul <laughs> yeah. uh, Goodman. Like, there's, there's everybody to get a spinoff. It's so it's so captivating that like I just I. I I like Mad Men and I like mm -hmm. Homeland, but it's just, I, I don't understand yeah, why don't it hasn't got as much credit. And, you know, thankfully, Brian Cranston, in terms of Emmys, not Golden Globes, has gotten some credit. He's won Outstanding Lead Actor three years. He won it in 2008, 2009, 2010. He lost this last year to Damian Lewis, also from Homeland, which okay. was cleaning up. But, um, you know, at least he's finally getting the credit it deserves and yeah. sadly hasn't carried over to the whole series because I think the whole series is amazing yes. like it's not just him he he yes. definitely leads the way but there are other people as you said like Giancarlo Esposito mm -hmm. and Aaron Paul who are just so phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. that it it needs to be if it doesn't get the win for best dramatic series in its last season which yeah. it's coming up to in mm -hmm. I don't know six months or whatever something like that um it, it it'll be a tragedy. Like it'll absolutely be a tragedy. What, what's weird? I didn't realize because I got in. I think I got into Breaking Bad maybe like second season mm -hmm. or maybe even first season. I don't exactly remember when. I it wasn't when it first started, but it was. I mm -hmm. jumped into it late. Um, what's weird to realize? I didn't realize the first season was shortened due to the writing strike. Writer strike. Yeah, it was only six episodes. Yeah, and interestingly enough, Vince Gilligan has said recently in interviews that retrospectively having the first season one shortened due to the writer's strike actually helped him out in the long run because he planned on evolving Walt e into an evil character much faster uh, to conclude the season, specifically the first season, in a shocking way. And he said with the strike, he could make it a, a it, gradual it ends evolution. It a perfect place. Oh, if I know. You if you haven't seen the show, it's just an amazing... Like, every season ends on an amazing Oh, yeah. Ends. And so it's just fascinating to think about, like... Of all the bad things that I remember that came out of the writer strike back then, to think of that, essentially Vince Gilligan feels like Breaking Bad was a success because the writer strike, and that's kind of that's an interesting, interesting thing. Yeah. It's also interesting to note if it wasn't for the show, all of the roles we're about to talk about would not have happened because pretty much almost every role he's got Hollywood role he's gotten considered for afterwards have been due to his work on Breaking Bad, which is funny because. They're not exactly gigantic roles. No, but so. there's there's one specific I'll I'll get to. Okay. We'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Um, moving right along, we're mm -hmm. gonna go to 2011. Sort of really hit the point at which he's in. I mean, he's like in six films yeah. a year the last couple Seriously. of years. Um, Contagion, the yes. Steven Soderbergh um, drama that's essentially about the <laughs> unfolding of a virus yes. spreading around the world and sort of like the pandemic results of like millions of people dying and catching this you virus. so uh, eloquently whether you came up with it or just told me about it when it first came out outbreak with gwyneth paltrow as the monkey yeah i can't take credit for that but it is true like it is it is it is wild because it it documents the unfolding of the virus yes. and all i mean there's so many characters this, <laughs> this is one of the things the film was known for is having like a dozen major yes. cast members you know gwyneth paltrow matt damon Lawrence fishburne uh jude law Brian Cranston, Kate Winslet, Maria and Cantard. Um, it's just so yeah. many people are all have equally major roles. Yes, because it's a kind of a worldwide evolving story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and it's sort of, it, it, it documents all these different stories during this evolving drama and then sort of ultimately it goes back and traces the origin mm -hmm. to how it all began. Yeah, because as people kind of start reacting to it, then they start trying to trace where it found. And well, it's that, kind I mean, of a dual race of it spreading throughout the world while they're trying to find where it came from and stop it. And that's sort of the importance of Brian Cranston's roles. He's part of like, you know, the CDC slash yes. army response and that's sort of like, how do we handle this pandemic do i mean do you walls and fire everywhere well that's pretty much it like it's sort of like how uh, w at what point you sort of have to say you know like that this is a this is a, an acceptable loss yeah. and we have to move on and just try and save what we can save it's sort of mm. it's a real it's, it's sort of a crazy thing i've been mm -hmm. thinking about i was thinking about this when i was watching the end of Shaun of the dead where they sort of go up that elevator mm -hmm. and suddenly there's all these military people yes. there. sort of like how do you how do you determine you know acceptable casualties and you know 
if something's as a worldwide catastrophe, yeah. like how do you sort of plan your strategic yes. uh, moves in response to it and try and get ahead of this disaster before it kills it's everybody? So it's so well done too. It's if you if you ever want to freak yourself out, just watch this movie during flu season, and you won't want to go mm-hmm. outside because it's just heartbreaking and 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 very. Um, it lo- the the disease levels the playing field for a lot of characters without spoiling things. It totally. definitely takes some interesting situations and mashes them all into this common misery. And as you said, like when you figure out sort of how it all begins, it's kind of simply terrifying how <laughs> ordinary it is yes. and how that you're amazed that doesn't happen all the time. They had an on set like scientist. I don't remember the gentleman's name, but Steven Soderbergh had a guy on set to talk science with and make sure like to the point where they even reshot a scene where an actress is injecting her with something because she did it through her lab coat. And he's like, nope, that would break the needle. Stupid. Reshoot it. Like really? stuff like that. And wow, one of the things crazy. that he talked about is that the actual disease that they use in the, in the movie is a disease that does exist that he oh, actually scary. created. Not to that level of grossness, but he was like, oh yeah, it's a thing back in the 90s. I put when I, it was this thing that affected pigs that got human sick. And you're like, oh, that's really horribly that's frightening. That's fucked up, yeah. Like, that's fucked up. Also nope. interesting to promote the film Warner Brothers left um, in, in Canada. They filled two giant Petri dish dishes treated with bacteria and fungi and set them in a Toronto storefront window. Wow, that's fucked Over up. several days, the bacteria and fungi specimens begin to grow and spell out the name of the film and form biohazard symbols. That's fucked up. <laughs> that, that's creative, but that's fucked Imagine up. Imagine if you didn't know there was a movie named Contagion and you just saw mold that said Contagion with biohazard, even in a storefront. I'd be like, that is a remarkably smart disease. <laughs> be like, I'm gonna look up this Contagion and hope that it's not yeah. Yahoo News. Everybody run. Yeah, everybody's dead. Yeah. Um, same that, year. That was, that was a good. That was a good film. But mm-hmm. uh, moving along, same year, mm-hmm. a much more uh, important role in mm-hmm. a much better film, if you ask me. Yes. Drive. Yes. He played the role of uh, let's see, Shannon, yes. which was essentially sort of the boss slash agent character of Ryan Gosling's Driver, Driver. Mm-hmm. Um, who unfortunately is put in an awkward position <laughs> when he sort of introduces. Ryan Gosling to Albert Brooks yes. and was Ron, it, Perlman. Ron Perlman serve as a driver for them, which ultimately, once things go wrong, he but, serves. Yeah, he's he, the point of contact. So he's yeah. the point of contact and he's the point of pressure for yes. them upon Ryan Gosling. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you know, again, you know, Contagion, he sort of played a hardline character. And this one, he played. A sort of tra not I don't want to say tragic hero, mm. but like a tragic. How about a lovable bastard? Because he's kind of a greasy son of a gun in the beginning. He's clearly like this mechanic who rides both lines of like yeah. legality and sure. illegality. He's got this kid working for him that clearly is underutilized and he's probably underpaying. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that even. I feel like he just he has a love of Ryan Gosling and mm. yeah, he might ride a morality line, mm-hmm. but he he just it's a it's you feel bad for the dude because he's yeah. not he's not trying to screw anyone <laughs> over, but he's put in a position where he gets majorly fucked yes. over because yes. of events that are completely out of his control. Mm-hmm. Like, he has nothing to do with what goes on, and yet when it shit goes sideways, mm-hmm. he has to feel the f- blowout, yes. blowback of it. Let's so. jump down the rabbit hole for a minute with this. Please do. So, Brian Cranston previously guest starred in a 1998 episode of The X-Files Okay. called Drive. The episode dun, dun, dun. Uh, where he collaborated with screenwriter Vince Gilligan, creator of Breaking Whoa. Bad, uh, who, impressed by his performance as a sympathetic villain in the episode, would ultimately lead him to cast him as Walter White in Breaking Bad, which ultimately led him to being cast in Drive. That's pretty freaking awesome. The episode's even called Drive. How cool That's is that? Like, it's not even, like, random, like, he's in a random episode, so be like it. Episode called Drive, where he played a bad guy, which made him go on to play a bad guy, which got him in a role in a movie called that's, Drive. That's pretty freaking awesome. I like rabbit holes. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice little circle mm-hmm, of life. Mm-hmm. Um, circle of life! Yeah, and that second singing. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, wa- I want to note, though, that, you know, as good as he is, it's a fucking tragedy 
that Albert Brooks wasn't nominated oh, for an God. Academy Award, let alone won it. Like, Christopher yeah. Plummer, you're very good in Beginners. Yes. Albert Brooks was absolutely phenomenal yes. as the villain in Drive. So unlike Albert Brooks so that unlike I revised my opinion of him after that role. Totally. totally. I was like, oh, okay, maybe I need to go back and re-watch, uh, what's the, Holly Hunter broadcast news? Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Like, like, maybe I need to rewatch broadcast totally, news again. Totally changes that. Like, <laughs> if, if you want to see a similar sort of situation, check out Ezra Miller, and we need to talk mm. about Kevin, and then... Ooh. Perks of a, okay. being a wallflower, such a different thing. But like, it's it's just so phenomenal. I feel I like feel he is absolutely robbed. Mm-hmm. Just got to repeat that once yes. again. Yes, yes. Let's we jump. Let that, we can't that let that get away. No, we we hear you're listening. Academy Awards. Oh, Very correct your shit. Also, Nicholas Wend- Wending Rimpf, or however you pronounce Rimpf, his name. Yeah, doesn't have any interest in cars. Doesn't have a driver's license. Wow. Failed his test eight times. All right, good person to direct a film about a driver. Shows how good of a director he yeah. is, though. Let's let's jump forward to 2012, though, in a film that you have a big passion about. We've talked about it before, and we're talking about John, John Carter. Carter. Yes. This is uh, based on the was it the story by Edgar Rice Burroughs? Yep. Princess for, of Mars, which came out like a hundred years ago or 1936, something. 1936, wow. if I remember correctly. Eighty, almost eighty years ago. Or uh, no, longer than that. Sorry, because the yeah yeah older than that. I think it was actually the teens or the early 20s which is amazing to think about how sort of technologically advanced i mean i don't know if the movie is the same as the book but how technologically advanced Mm -hmm. that world is considering how not technologically advanced they were at that time most of that is actually relatively uh true to the source material as far as like flying ships that seem kind of more like a cross between dirigibles and (laughs) you know big winged vessels yeah um in terms of you know, Brian Cranston, his part in the movie is fairly small, and it's Powell. all oh, Pow, yeah. all towards the beginning where he's essentially chasing <laughs> after, was it a uh, Taylor Kitsch's yes. character yes. who goes on the run, who's John Carter. Yes, because uh, if I remember correctly, Brian Cranston plays this like commanding officer. Yes, who yeah. tries to get him to do something, mm-hmm. doesn't go so well. You know, they go after John Carter. Because yes. um, John it, Carter's a Confederate. Yes, yeah. yes. And they sort of, he ends up running into. Um, one of the creatures from Mars. Yeah, gets, yeah, runs into the Apache weird Apache cave yes. that they both end up that he ends up getting transported to yes. Mars through. And so you know, sadly, you know, it's a very short role for Brian mm-hmm. Cranston. It's a good one though. I like mm-hmm. I like the opening of the film. It's a very interesting film. You know, uh, I was I was very curious to see how Andrew Stanton would transition to a live action director. Obviously, he did like you know Wally, yes. which I absolutely love. And and Finding whole, Nemo, Finding Nemo, all, all sorts of stuff at Pixar. He's been yes. involved since like the beginning. Yes. Um, Tremendously talented guy, you know. Sadly, this film was not super well received. It was not. Um, the film I thought I thought it was fairly fun. Yeah, it's I mean, that's the, that's the thing that's probably the most upsetting to me about this film. There's movies that have bombed theatrically that had a lot of hype and were crap or just bombed that you know made sense for their own various reasons. Sure. But the thing that bothered me the most about this movie is that or about its its failure is that it wasn't actually a bad movie Mm -hmm. it was literally just that so much money had been put into it that it had to be an amazing movie to ever make it and because 250 million dollar budget yeah and because of something i'll i'll mention here in a minute i mean it had been talked about for so long that it's the ball had been rolling the hype was there even if disney hadn't put all that crap load of money into it because it probably i mean not a hundred percent but i i would be surprised if there's anything else that has actually got completed that would fit into this category. But it probably holds the record for having the longest period of development hell, where it was just sitting in stagnation, only because it actually did get made. There's probably movies that have been sitting longer or as long. Sure, sure. Okay, 79 years. Wow, that's crazy. 79 years it was in production hell. Pre-production for a film version started first started in 1931. So yeah, it definitely came out before that. When Robert Clampett, director of Looney Tunes, approached author Edgar Rice Burroughs, who was still alive, to make an animated feature out of the first book in the series, because he was still writing them at the time. That's crazy. A Princess of Mars, the same story the film was adapted from. Uh, having Had the plans gone through, it would have become America's first animated feature, beating Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs wow. by six years. But... It stayed in development hell until 2010 when filming officially started in London. Yeah, it's it's. I, I, I definitely remember reading about it over time. Like I think like Harry Knowles was involved with it we, at some we point. We talked about last time uh, Robert Rodriguez before Sin City was attached yeah, yeah, yeah. to it. And I mean, it's... 
And to be kind of frank, you know, like it's 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 a cool movie. It looks it has good, weaknesses. but like I don't think it feels like a two hundred and fifty million dollar no. film. Like unfortunately, I, 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 I look at it and I just don't understand where the two hundred and fifty million dollars. I went. basically look at it and I see how it didn't succeed and how much money it cost, and then I am amazed that the Transformer movies are almost as expensive and make money and i just don't understand where america's priorities are <laughs> yeah but, I th but I mean, that, that again this is the age-old battle of you and i versus transformers so i won't delve deep into that but there's can. lots of huge big budget crap sure. movies that didn't get shit on as much as this but i think also you know like i think it was a nice a nice story i mean mm -hmm. nothing revolutionary it was nice yeah, it's an old story but at the same time, like it just—I don't know—if like if you had made this for a hundred million dollars, maybe mm. it would have been yeah good, or maybe even a hundred and fifty. That probably be pushing it. But you think about like Brad Bird making Mission Impossible Four. Mm -hmm. I think it was something like hundred and fifty million dollars okay. for the budget of that, and that made like six hundred, eight hundred million dollars or whatever. Um, but it just—it feels like you gotta. It, it, Two hundred fifty million dollars for your first live action film is yes. way out of control. Like that's that's sort of like Spider Man yes. franchise type things, and for something that's a completely unknown property, yeah. despite the books being successful, yeah. is way way and out of control. I, and from what I heard, a lot of that was that they basically were so willing to let Andrew Stanton do what he want that they didn't try to put any restraints on him. That's crazy. And that they just kind of let him run wild. And unfortunately. Uh, animation and live action are different, so yeah. <laughs> you can't. You you maybe need somebody there to say, not such a good idea. I also feel like it might have been the the fact that it was in the first week of March when it came out. Yeah, that's bad. Really, is like state. first week of March is and first week of it's May tough. are usually so huge that if you have a giant blockbuster that comes out that week that isn't stellar, it's just simply gonna bomb based yeah, on the fact tough. of being an early year blockbuster. So it's tough. You're right. Yeah. Good point. It's worth the rent. Check it out. Uh, another one that uh, Brian Cranston was in this year that was sort of a more significant part, but not necessarily bigger, mm -hmm. was in Total Recall yes. as Cohagen, mm -hmm. the villain of the film. Michael um, Ironside's character, right, from the original? No. Well, or it was... I'm trying to remember if that's who he... Well, he, was, he, was, he wasn't Cohagen. The, the other guy oh, was Cohagen. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Sorry. Um, but... The problem that I have is, you know, Cohagen was a major villain in the original movie. Yes. Not necessarily the case here. Essentially, Kate Beckinsale yes. is made into it. It's um, Sharon Stone and Michael Ironside are combined yes, their characters right. to create her character in this movie. And then movie. what's left over, Brian Cranston fills in. Well, he was Co he's Cohagen. <laughs> Cohagen's Cohagen. Ah, okay. But the problem is, in this film, it's essentially like she's a Terminator That's right, hunting yes. <laughs> Colin Farrell. Whereas, like in the first one, she's she's in in the beginning a little bit, then in the, <laughs> in a little bit later, and then you know that's it. Whereas she's constantly like she's un an unstoppable mm -hmm. force in this. And you know when you have someone as badass and as sexy as Kate Beckinsale. I can kind of understand where you're coming from, but it still, it sort of undercuts the role of Cohagen in the story. And, you know, taking out the plot line of the mutants and stuff like that yes. kind of waters down the whole production anyway. So, yes. it, I mean, I if I were him, I, I would sort of understand the desire to play that role, mm -hmm. but then you kind of get all your legs cut out from under you, and it kind of, it's like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. One of the few interesting things that I thought about this movie, not actually interesting about the movie itself, but more about weird trivia, is the fact that Colin Farrell was in Minority Report, which was mm -hmm. originally going to be a sequel to Total Recall. Interesting. It's kind of, you know... Circle of Life yeah. again. Yep. Circle of Life. <laughs> the Lion uh, King episode, the unofficial. Lion King all up in this bitch. Yeah. Now you just need to find a way that Brian Cranston's connected to the Lion King and we'd be I set. I bet you it's not that hard. I bet you it's like Six two degrees. degrees of Brian Cranston. I, I bet you it's two degrees. I would be very surprised <laughs> if you had to go a third degree to It'd catch be him. pretty interesting. To I'll Google! Go, I'll go to a third degree. <laughs> Anyway, that brings us to this Friday, which is the 12th of October. We're talking Argo, the Very interesting third movies. Ben Affleck directed film. Yes. Uh, this is the is story. The third? What's the second? Gone, baby, gone. Oh, the okay, town. yeah. I thought the town was the first, but no, that's. No. Oh, yeah. No. Boom. You just got served, son. Well, I asked you. Is yeah, it really you served? It's true. No. I didn't say, you're no. lying, it's two. You're, you're right. It's true. <laughs> um, anyway. The film takes place during the Iranian invasion. Based on true story, again. Uh, yep. Way to go, uh, Ben Affleck. Yep. And, uh, and the CIA is set with the task of extraditing a, <laughs> a group of six Americans who have found um, shelter at the home of the Canadian ambassador. Such a crazy real-life story. Mm -hmm. So crazy. They go, they can't politically get the prisoners out of Iran, 
So they go to make a fake movie and smuggle the hostages out as fake as extras. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. Like it just it look the trailer looks phenomenal. Oh yeah. I'm a huge Ben Affleck fan, both as an actor and a director. I look as forward to that. It looks like Brian Cranston might have a, a big role. I'm mm-hmm. hoping. At least he's listed at the top of the credits Whoa. on IMDB for what that's <laughs> worth. I don't know if that's anything. You're above Ben? He is above Ben. Wow, look at yeah. you. Um also should note though that this film is getting a lot of early buzz for being a best picture nominee and possibly a best director nominee so awesome. uh, I'm definitely looking forward to checking yeah. out this film it's very high on my list of this uh, such, release a, this such an interesting real life story that it's I, I mean <laughs> I, how can you not be interested in it and as a, as a film person the simple fact of one line in the trailer would interest me if I didn't know anything else about the movie and that is um, I think trying to remember which actor it might be alan arkin that says it he says if i'm gonna make a fake movie i'm gonna make a damn good one or like i'm gonna oh, make yeah. a hit yeah and i was just oh, like yeah, 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 that's, yeah. that's that's a great line that's yeah. just an awesome idea to be like okay we're doing this huge thing that could be deadly we could all get killed but let's at least not be known for the guys making that crappy movie <laughs> yeah no it's i mean it's just it's a great idea ben mm-hmm. affleck is a great director i i mean if he wins an academy award more power to him i definitely think yeah. he deserves some respect because his first two films have been phenomenal yeah so. and let's hope brian cranston has a a full role in the film totally. simply, because i want i want to see that guy's chops he's totally. got him he he, need, he needs lead roles in movies like yes. i'm just saying it right now if after breaking bad and yes. if he doesn't get any lead roles, I will freaking start an internet campaign. I kind of wonder if that's why he's been in so support, many supporting because he Maybe. can't do it. Which you got to give the guy credit then if that's the case because he's been like in a, a supporting role in six or seven yeah. major movie, movies in the last like two years. Maybe. That's, <laughs> I, I, I hope that's it. That would be the positive spin. Yeah. So in that case, we got till 2014, and Brian Cranston will be ours. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's it for Brian Cranston. Join us next time for our DVD rundown for the week of October 16th. Mm-hmm. And as I'm always, doing can... his math in his head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as always, you can find us on MacGuffinPodcast.com, mm-hmm. Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Blip, Miro, Roku. Get glue. Check in. We got stuff on YouTube. Not these episodes, but stuff. They're on you there. check some stuff. Oh, these episodes? <laughs> I check it all the time. I don't know what you're talking about, Spencer. I'm always moderating the comments. <clears throat> we'll see you next time. Maybe not Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it'll dun, just dun, cut dun. the screen down yeah. <laughs> Black. I'm going to get a puppet. Ooh, that's what you could do. You could put, Where this is, this is where you could put the graphics and trailers while you just keep talking the whole time. Thank you for telling me. Replacement host. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> Maybe see you next time. One of us will. can't stop me. I'm fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm fire tonight. Don't even try to bite the Mr. Spock can't stop me. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm fire tonight. The board can't stop me. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.